I'm really not camera ready, so. Five. <laughs> as far as about myself, I have eight grandchildren. I am the executive director of the rescue mission in Trenton. I'm engaged to be married. Do I love my job? <laughs> Stop making me laugh, dude. It's really been a drudgery for the last 33 years, but I, I think I'll learn it in the next couple of years and enjoy it more. I like to play sports. Father of eight, I'm married, and I'm here to change my life. I think it's easiest if you understand that the, the rescue mission, it's a very real, basic, human institution. The word institution at the end doesn't belong. People arrive at the rescue mission with a whole host of problems. Addictions, mental health issues, homelessness, hunger, criminal histories. They come to the mission seeking services that'll give them the opportunity to rebuild their lives. I can't get to the job. They're no problem. I can't promise we have them. If we got them, you got them. Okay? In order to assist them, we provide an emergency shelter, a soup kitchen, a drug and alcohol treatment program, and permanent housing. It's not about recovery. It's not about failures. It's not about success. It's about a simple person. I have the existence that most would consider pretty normal. I live in a townhouse with my lady out in the suburbs. We have two cars, six birds, the dog, the attic, the basement, two floors, a patio. She works, I work. To this day, I'm sure if you ask my mother or my father and you tell them that Elvin Ruiz was homeless, they would not know that. They would not know that. I had very much an attitude when I came. Homeless people were homeless because that was their choice. They wanted to be homeless to be homeless. But uh, in, within months, I found out that's not what it was all about. Some people are just trying, 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 trying. And there are people like me who had a job and doing well, and now they don't have a job anymore, so they chose to disconnect from everybody. They don't know what to do. They just don't know what to do. When I was a kid, it, Trenton had all businesses, all factory work. It had a lot of work around here. Now there's nothing here, it's just parking lots and state buildings, and that's it. Well, my mom, she was a single parent. She's been there all of my life. I was always close with her. You know, she never really turned her back on me, it's just that I had other kids younger than me, and she sacrificed me to save the rest of them. And I didn't know at the time, but I understand now. You know, she did the best that she could. Okay, my name's Wayne Frischella. Uh I'm a clerk in the administrative office at the rescue mission. Uh, I answer all the phone calls. I do correspondence stuff for Mary Gay. It makes it helps the mission, you know, move along better. That's what I do. My father was an alcoholic. My mother died when I was six of cancer. So I really, really wasn't brought up. I was more or less drug up, you know. <laughs> we ended up in foster care because my father went back to drinking. Didn't like it there. So when I was 16, I just went on my own. Started working. I was doing all right. Doing good, actually. And then, I would say, 1981, I started using heroin. I guess the thing that most people don't know about addiction is that it is a disease. I've been to school, I dress myself, I drive a car. How can something as simple as any mood altering substance control me? Up until 18, you would see my history and you say, what the heck, what's this guy doing here? He's got Catholic grammar school, a couple years of a prep school in Princeton, a Notre Dame high school. What's going on here? Such is the life of someone who gets caught uh, up in the teeth of drug and alcohol abuse. For a, a, a logical person, the alternative would be stop drinking, stop getting high, 
save your money while you have the opportunity, get your own place. But for me, the answer was just to leave that place and go live in an abandoned car at night. It had a window busted and it was raining that night. There were mosquitoes coming in through that broken window. And here I am all scrunched up in the back of this abandoned car trying not to be seen. That's a pretty miserable night. Without question, without question, I believe every person needs a place to come in off the street. I've had people come in off the street who've never ever been homeless before, scared to death. My job is to calm them and make them feel comfortable. For one thing, a lot of shelters serve them bag lunches. We serve you food on a plate. It's kind of like the way that it's handed to you. It all represents caring. Mary Gay, she sees me. She knows me by face. I know, I know we're over there. There she is right there. <laughs> I'm hungry. Here she comes, here she comes. That's the person right there. That's the one that, because of her. Because of her, I'm, I'm a hell of a lot better in my life now. When you're in the emergency shelter, it's just that. It's a meal, a bed, a place to stay, a place to get cleaned up. Uh, hopefully they'll, they'll meet someone in the staff and the staff will say, you know, you don't have to live this way if you want to make changes, here are some possibilities. My job is to some people that are on drugs and alcohol, to talk with them and work with them and get them into our treatment program or to any treatment program. In a group like this, which is not a 12-step program, but we identify 12-step programs as being very helpful and we try to encourage people to get involved in them, um, if you go for a little bit of time, you start recognizing your situations are not unique to you. There are people who have gone through what you've gone through and have gotten through the other side of it sober and in a positive way. I've I always been like an outsider, I guess you would say. That's one of the reasons why I got high a lot, because of my family not being there. But then coming to a place like this, you know, I shared my story the first night, and I cried that whole time, but they respected me for that. I never thought that I would get respect from crying in front of grown men. Recovery is more than clean time. You can't recover unless you stay clean, but recovery itself involves finding a positive way to live your life. They have something here called work therapy. If you come in here, if you have a skill, they put you right to work, you know? and uh, it keeps you real busy by doing something that you like to do. And I like working hands-on with tools. That's why it's important for me to work up here in the shop. I'm gonna make a shelf out of that. At the Rescue Mission, our work therapy program is about teaching the resident um, to be accountable again. If the residents quit doing what they do, the rescue mission quits working. Um, everything from the kitchen to the toilet paper, a resident is somehow involved in that. 230 clients every day, seven days a week, 365 a year. We got guys that do the showers, guys that sweep the pop, guys, everybody helps roll the bedrolls and disperse it throughout the building. Sheets, pillowcases, towels, blankets. Watch, folded, rolled up, and delivered on the each floor, dispersed. You know, it's teamwork. Thirty percent of the operating budget of the rescue mission comes from the store, from the industrial salvage. <laughs> not only puts the residents to work and gives them life skills, but 30% of the operating budget comes from the store itself. You have any, uh, mainly furniture, but you also have clothing bags that are picked up. Anything from mattresses to couches, your basic furniture pickup. I ain't never seen nothing like that before. <laughs> <laughs> The room we're sitting in right now is called uh, Teach 
and um, you know, I have different meetings here. I, I took a job readiness course. I took a GED course. I took a business course. I got a call from the job I work now, um, Dick Sporting Goods. The guy interviewed me, and from the job readiness class that I took here, I was able to ask the interviewer questions. When do you evaluate your uh, employees? Questions like that, and he was kind of surprised. I know I kind of shocked him, they hired me. And I was very happy about that, man. That took the self-esteem from, okay, you're back now, you're doing good, to another level, to a point where I said, oh my God, I'm working. guy gets his substance abuse problem in, in order and he goes out and he gets a small job. Well, the next thing that happens is he owes child support. So he thought he would have X amount for rent. Now he doesn't have that, he only has this. What to the average person is a problem, but could be a resolvable problem when you write the check, becomes the seed the ground in which five other problems will take hold. When you meet some of the guys who have gone through here and live you know, relatively normal, good lives, they, I think we have to understand that they had to put a hundred things in place to even begin to get on that first row. I stayed here at the Mission from 93 until 97. And I went back out and I found a job and I worked, sent my daughter through college. From 93 into 92, I mean, 02, I stayed clean. Then my mom passed away and uh, I was like a little overwhelmed, so I went back to drinking. I didn't have the courage to just go or jump in front of a bus, but I figured if I drink enough, I'm gonna just fall out and die. You know, I don't have to feel the pain anymore. Do we say, well, he's a write-off? Or do we say, if he comes back again, that he has at least had the experience of recovery at one time in his life and can build upon that? I'd like to think the latter is a better way to approach the problem. It took courage for me to come back in that door. You know, it took a lot of courage. And I realized that once I came back in, you know, I was beating myself up out there. And this is one of the most courageous things I did in my life is try to save my life. Again, I was worried about what everybody else thought you know, about me, and I, I knew I had a place to come to. It just took me five years to get here. The, the only role that the Rescue Mission can play in a part of that is to constantly be here. It's a constant. The constant of the rescue mission being here, the constant of you showing them respect, love, understand, that whole constant. And it takes a constant to change a person's life. We had a counselor over there, his name was Tony. We called him Phony Tony. But he said some things that stuck with me all this time. He told me whatever I wanted out of life wants me. I just got to be the one to go after it. I got to be the one to work to get them things. And I found it to be true. It's not the material things that you need. They showed me a lot of love here, a lot of love that you need. When you ask about the face of, of an individual, I guess I ask myself and I ask the people of you this, you know, see his pain, see his pain. The guy's been through a very painful experience. But I'd also ask that we see his hope. It's that attitude, don't look back to what he's done, look to what he's trying to do. And that, that is so much more important. I would hate to be judged by everything I've done and not have a future. Sometimes that's the worst thing that happens, I think, is drugs, prison terms, limited education, all the problems we've talked about. They destroy the past, but when they take the future, that's the high price.